perfect. All right. Well, I'm I'm most embarrassed by uh, by Dr. Tosi's introduction, but I really appreciate it. And what really warms my heart is to um, know that all of my dear friends are on and recognizing Matt Warman's voice without even realizing he was on <laughs> is is special. And and like all of us, I think we I really mourn the fact that we're not together. But it is with great pleasure that I would like to talk to you about the management of pregnancy and delivery in patients with a skeletal dysplasia. Um, this is a collective work. Um, this is work that I think everybody has contributed to um, in terms of understanding something that's really rare without a great deal of published literature. All right, so now I've got to figure out how to make my slides advance. Click the screen and then you can use the arrow buttons. Okay, great. So I have no disclosures. Um, so our skeletal system is one of our largest organ systems next to the skin, which is our largest organ um, system. And you know, I think one of the challenges that we all face is that the osteochondral dysplasias, which are disorders of bone and cartilage, there's more than 460 well-defined disorders with people who continue to define new disorders. They primarily have a defect in bone and cartilage. Um, Disease-producing mutations have been identified in most of these disorders, um, which really opens up our ability to provide genetic counseling to um, our patients and families. Um, and while this is a changing number, I think about 150 of these disorders are severe enough to be recognized in the prenatal period, while the rest of them are typically diagnosed after birth. Um, and while we think that these disorders primarily affect the skeleton, many other organ systems can be affected. And, and that's really what I sort of, my, my message here is to really think about the physiology of the disorder that you see. So I think some of, some of us have seen the slide that I made a long, long time ago, but the whole point of the slide is that the genes that are involved in producing skull dysplasias affect every single part of the cell, um, from cell signaling to function of intracellular organelles, and how a pregnancy is going to respond to these cascades of signals is really the challenge in taking care of these patients. So what are our gaps um, in knowledge when it comes to taking care of patients with skeletal disorders and pregnancies? Um, you know, I, I regret to say that if you read the old literature, the medical community was not typically very supportive of women with short stature, particularly the more severe forms, um, having pregnancies. And perhaps it was, is, was meant well, but paternalistic. Um, one of our challenges that remain, and I, I, would, I hope people ask about this, is how does pregnancy and breastfeeding affect the skeleton, particularly in disorders that have an effect on bone mineralization? And that would obviously include osteogenesis imperfecta, hypophosphatasia, Marfan syndrome. And there really is a difference between, as you know, all of you who are experts, there's a difference between bone quality and quantity. Um, and I don't think that that's really resolved in our understanding of how breastfeeding affects bone. Um, are there more pregnancy complications in women with skeletal disorders, um, including even the mild forms of disease? Um, and are the fetal outcomes the same between women with skeletal disorders versus average stature women? And I am not talking inheriting the disorder. I'm talking, is there a difference between gestational age at time of delivery, birth weight, birth length? I mean, so obviously independent of genotype. And what's the best mode of delivery or timing of delivery in these women? And I think it's really important because data in um, obstetrics show that fetus is delivered after 39 weeks and even though fetus is delivered after 40 weeks have better outcomes particularly for neurodevelopment. So I think what I hope that people will use these slides for is to understand 
what the maternal physiologic adaptations that occur in pregnancy, and then understanding how these adaptations would affect a patient with a certain disorder in terms of what you're seeing. So obviously major adaptations are necessary in the maternal anatomy, physiology, metabolism for a successful pregnancy. And what I often tell patients is, if I took out a liver from one person, put it into somebody and didn't suppress their immune system, they would die of graft versus, graft versus host disease incredibly quickly. Yet we carry pregnancies of individuals who are not ourselves. Surrogates carry pregnancies of people who are not even you know, related to them. And yet there's this incredible adaptation um, in the immune system. In addition, the increase in total body water goes from 6.5 to 8 liters. There's an increased maternal blood volume by 1.5 liters. The water content of the fetus, placenta, and amniotic fluid approaches 3.5 liters. And you know, if you talk to a cardiologist, they would use the term that pregnancy is a state of chronic volume overload. Um, and there is an increase in cardiac output that goes to from 5.6 liters per minute, which hopefully all of us are doing presently, to 6.2 liters, and in twins it can go up to seven liters, which is you know one of the concerns we have about women with extreme short stature who may have any cardiopulmonary issues um, having twin gestations. So this is an adaptation of work that was done by Steve Clark, um, and it's not to bore people on. Um, the details, but I think if you look at the percent changes from non-pregnant state, you can see how cardiac output goes up, how heart rate goes up, how vascular resistance actually drops, um, and that pulmonary vascular resistance also changes. So this is really just to think about how the cardiopulmonary system adapts to pregnancy. So if you look at the American College of Cardiology guidelines about cardiac function in pregnancy, the goals of a pregnancy is to achieve maximum cardiac output. So when I see a pregnant woman with a skeletal disorder, this is the first concern I have. Is there going to be any cardiac dysfunction? Um, and if there is even a consideration that the patient that is presenting to you, with regardless of the diagnosis, has any possibility of a cardiac dysfunction, either based on the disorder itself, um, and you know, I'll, I'm sort of not making this up, but for example, somebody has acromicric dysplasia, extremely rare, but we know that that's associated with um, pulmonary fibrosis. You, you need to think about how you're gonna approach that pregnancy. So precautions are indicated based on what we know about that specific skeletal dysplasia and cardiopulmonary dysfunction, if there's any question, we would recommend to obtain a pre-pregnancy echo if that's possible, sometimes it isn't, and then follow with echocardiograms during each trimester. Um, if there is any possibility of need for a corrective valve surgery, um, particularly, I'm just gonna say Marfan syndrome, but there are other skeletal disorders that there are um, need corrective valves. Please, it's ideally performed prior to pregnancy. Um, and then there's always the challenge of how you manage a mechanical valve in pregnancy. Um, and it really has to do with the issues surrounding anticoagulation. If the ejection fraction is less than 45%, based on the obstetrical literature, there's going to be a high incidence of maternal and fetal morbidity. This is not an absolute number, um, but it is one where you, you need to raise concern and develop a management team. Um, obviously, individuals with cardiac dysfunction that have an, an injection fraction less than 40% really have a guarded prognosis. Um, and while you know, it's small, there is incidence of aortic and valvular disease in osteogenesis imperfecta, Morchios, Larson syndrome, Stickler syndrome, 
um, Marfan's, Louis Dietz syndromes, you know, congenital contracture, arachnodactyly. So I think for each patient who presents, you have to determine whether or not there is a risk for aortic and mitral valve disease. Um, and um, the most common valvular dysfunction in connective tissues in general is aortic regurg. Um, and it is recommended that these patients need afterload reduction to reduce the stress on the left side. However, ACE inhibitors, which are considered by cardiologists probably one of the better drugs to use to reduce um, afterload, are contraindicated in a pregnancy because they are actually indeed a teratogen. Um, there are pulmonary adaptations that are independent of, of cardio, um, the, the cardiac system. There's a change in the configuration of the thoracic cage. And if you ever talk to a pregnant woman, they will co often complain of intercostal pain and tell you that they haven't gained that much weight, but their bra, bra size has changed. And the reason is, is because of the relaxation actually the, ch the thoracic cage um, adapts and actually has a larger AP diameter. There's, this is due to relaxation of the ligaments between the ribs and the sternum. Um, the subcostal angle increases um, and the, tra the, tra the traverse diameter of the chest expands by two centimeters. Um, the diaphragm rises four centimeters. Um, and there's decreased excursion. And so that is what we refer to as pregnant women having more dead space and that they will complain that they are more short of breath, that they have an increased respiratory rate, but really their lung volumes are static. Anyone who's been pregnant will tell you by the third trimester, they feel like they can't breathe and that you know, they're short of breath and they actually are not, but it's really all of these pulmonary adaptations that are, are um, happening. So again, this is a slide to illustrate all the changes. Um, and the one I think that the, is the most important to, ooh, sorry. to recognize is that total lung capacity is decreased um, and that there is increased residual volume that we refer to as dead space. So in many skeletal dysplasias, kyphoscoliosis is a problem. And the incidence of kyphoscoliosis in the general population independent of skeletal dysplasias is 0.02 to 0.07, um, to 0.7, I apologize. Um, but kyphoscoliosis is seen in many skeletal dysplasias from, and the more severe ones that I think about are SEMD Kozlowski type, metatropic dysplasia, SED congenita, OI, Larson syndrome. And if you read, again, old literature, um, kyphoscoliosis was once considered a contraindication to pregnancy. I don't believe it is anymore. Um, the primary concern is that there is cardiopulmonary compromise due to mechanical restriction associated with the spine deformity, and obviously can be further exacerbated by pregnancy-related changes. Um, Patients with large deformities associated with alveolar hypoventilation um, may require blood gas monitoring and non-invasive ventilation. Um, but so again, it's, it really underscores the importance of understanding pulmonary function in your patient with a skeletal dysplasia when they're pregnant. Um, as pregnancy advances, there's an increased ventilation and increased O2 consumption. Um, restricted lung disease, secondary to congenital, unrepaired, progressive scoliosis and pregnancy have not been studied. Um, so I don't have the answer. I just know that if there is a restrictive lung disease, that pulmonary function tests and close monitoring may be necessary. Um, and you know, restrictive lung disease, even without kyphoscoliosis, has been seen in numerous skeletal dysplasias, including osteogenesis imperfecta, SCFD, 
SEMD abnormal calcification type, among others. So just because someone presents without a severe scoliosis, I think the uh, I think we're still responsible to consider restrictive lung disease. Um, and similar to women who have low ejection fractions by echo, outcomes in women with vital capacities of less than 1.5 liter, which is less than 50% of, of predicted pulmonary functions, may have poor outcomes. So in terms of the skeleton, which is what we all love, um, Pregnancy was initially thought to be a state of physiologic hyperparathyroidism with maternal skeletal, cal maternal skeletal calcium loss um, needed to supply the fetus with calcium. Um, and it was thought that this was going to result in long-term maternal bone loss. But actually, it turns out that the majority of fetal calcium needs are met through a series of physiologic changes in calcium metabolism with really very long, without long-term consequences on the maternal skeleton. This is all based on average stature women. Um, it is not known in hypomineralization disorders what the long-term physiologic changes are, and this is something that we're presently studying. Um, the, fetal, the fetus accumulates 21 grams of calcium over its lifetime. Most of this is during the third trimester. And it, to me, this is what's most interesting, is in the first and second trimester, um, maternal calcium is maintained through changing calcium absorption um, in the GI tract. And it's really only the third trimester where the fetus actually gets its calcium from the maternal skeleton. So pregnancy effects on bone metabolism, I think, remains controversial. Um, there is an increased bone loss. Um, however, and it's estimated that, again, in average stature women, that you lose about 2 to 5% um, bone loss during a pregnancy. Um, pregnancy does increase bone turnover and remodeling. There is increased bone loss with breastfeeding because most of the calcium that is used for breastfeeding actually does come from the maternal skeleton and less from GI absorption. However, if you go read long-term studies about parity, which is the number of pregnancies you have and osteoporosis later in life, there is no good association between having multiple pregnancies and osteoporosis. How this affects our patients with skeletal disorders who may start with low bone mineral, to, you know, from, from the get-go of the pregnancy and later in life, I don't have the answer to. Um, the bone loss that does occur is much more in the trabecular bone than in the cortical bone. Um, and the use of additional calcium during pregnancy and lactation to prevent bone loss, I think, remains controversial. Um, I, I would love to hear the group's view on that, but I could not find any really great studies that show increasing calcium intake um, is going to prevent um, this, you know, bone loss in the third trimester. The majority of the present studies indicate that calcium supplementation um, at 1,000 to 1,500 grams a day um, is adequate, but is not going to decrease the amount of bone loss. So what should the suggested amount of calcium be used in pregnant patients? And we say 1,000 to, again, 1,500 in women who are average stature. We say that maintenance of normal vitamin D levels should be achieved at greater than um, 32 nanograms per mil. Again, these are in women who we are not known to have any bone issues. Um, women who present with a kyphoscoliosis, regardless of etiology, should be checked each trimester for worsening of their scoliosis. There should be an increased awareness of ligamentous laxity that happens in all patients who are pregnant, and if the underlying skeletal disorder has ligamentous laxity, it may worsen um, stabilization of joints. 
Um, and for osteogenesis imperfecta, there's a suggestion in the literature that there's an increased incidence of severe back pain, perhaps due to vertebral fractures. Um, this is not in my slide set, but my colleague um, Rashmi Rao is about to um, hopefully publish a paper showing that there is an absolute increase in vertebral fractures in pregnancies in women with OI. So I think it's something that um, we should um, be aware of. So I'm very interested in transient osteoporosis of the hip. It's a very, very rare complication seen in pregnancy and lactation. Um, the etiology is unknown. It's spontaneous and onset. It's a, characterized by severe pain. Um, there are MRI findings of bone marrow edema. Um, it can occur mostly at the hip, but has been seen at other sites. And as you can see the list um, from my orthopedic surgery colleagues, there are multiple um, treatments, um, including having surgical um, intervention for, for decompression. Um, and it's extremely rare. And when I went into the literature, there were eight women who were reported with OI. And almost all the other case reports wrote things say, saying things like, there's a strong history of osteoporosis in the family. So it really underscores whether our patients with um, low bone mass are really at risk for this very rare disorder, but it is a medical emergency and something that I think we should all be aware of. Um, going to the OIF meetings, I have met three women um, who have all had this um, in the postpartum period. Um, if you move through the postpartum period, which if you look at maternal mortality in the United States, the postpartum period is the highest risk for maternal mortality. And 50% of maternal mortality is actually due um, to hemorrhage. And as you know, there is a push in the United States to understand maternal mortality. We have the highest maternal mortality rate in the developed world, we're the last, we're the highest the country with the most amount, and last year it was 700 women. Um, and the question is, is there increased blood loss um, in pregnancies, um, in skeletal splashes? And this, I think, is particularly relevant for um, osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, and again, I think we have some preliminary data showing that there is an increased blood loss. Um, there are other things to consider. Um, that women who have skeletal dysplasias often um, undergo cesarean section, which puts them in um, a risk for immobility and increases their risk of thromboembolism um, because they themselves may already have decreased mobility secondary to their skeletal dysplasia. So if I could educate anybody is, you're supposed to get out of bed eight to 10 hours after cesarean section. And if you're not gonna be able to do that, we need to encourage our obstetrical colleagues to consider prophylactic um, heparin use um, for that period of time to decrease the risk of thromboembolism. Um, standard measures such as compression stockings, if you have a skeletal dysplasia, are not always easy or convenient to use. And so therefore I'm advocating for postpartum anticoagulation in a subset of patients who are gonna have decreased mobility. Um, and remember that in the first 48 hours after delivery, you mobilize all of this, what we call third space, all this excess fluid that pregnant women complain about. And there is a rapid re rise in cardiac output and exceeds 7.2 liters. And they've documented that in some women, it can transiently go up to eight or nine liters per minute. And again, if there's any possibility of cardiac output problems or afterload issues, it should be considered. Um, there are no large studies on skeletal disorders in pregnancy. Um, the best delineated outcomes are actually for osteogenesis and perfecta. There are fewer than 50 case reports, but out of all the disorders, this is the best represented disorder. Um, I think this is my personal opinion. Um, if the patient is mildly affected and near normal height, um, the maternal pelvis should be adequate for a vaginal delivery, but this needs to be determined by the obstetrician. 
Um, and I think this is relevant for mild osteogenesis imperfecta, hypochondroplasia, perhaps multiple epiphyseal dysplasia with near normal height. Again, I think this is open for debate. When we did our OI and pregnancy study, um, most of our patients, more than 50% of our patients with mild OI did deliver vaginally. So I think there's some support for that. Um, I, I wanna underscore something that if you've never done a cesarean section or you can't remember, they're traumatic deliveries. You're trying to get this baby out of a tiny, tiny incision. Um, so that needs to be considered. Um, if the mother or the fetus has a risk for a demineral, um, a dis a disorder of demineralization such as OI, I always tell people not to forget, do not put an instrument on the fetal head because it can lead to a subdural hematoma. So I think the best example of that would be the mother has mild OI, um, she's near average stature, she's having a vaginal delivery, and you don't know whether the fetus is gonna have OI or not because it's a 50-50 risk. Then. It, I always try to remember, say, please, 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 if they have a vaginal delivery, great, but don't put forceps or um, a vacuum on the fetal head if you can avoid it. Um, and the type of anesthesia, whether it's regional versus general, I think is very patient specific. Each carries inherent risk. Um, and what I'm trying to remind people is, is that more than 30 disorders have been documented to have abnormalities in the cervical vertebral bodies. And so you have to educate the anesthesiologist about the risk for if they need to do a rapid sequence intubation for any reason, for fetal distress, or the mother's unstable, that there needs to be a consideration about the cervical vertebral body. Um, other challenges is that we actually do see patients with skeletal dysplasias who present um, in a wheelchair. Um, I think we've seen, all seen patients pregnant with OI, metatropic dysplasia, and Larsen syndrome who have been in wheelchairs. These patients tend to be at more cardiopulmonary risk because they're likely to have more kyphoscoliosis. Immobility places these women at risk for a thromboembolic event. And so in these patients, I am suggesting that in addition to being aware of it, you should test these patients for thrombophilias independent of their skeletal dysplasia disorder because a 5% of the population potentially carries at-risk alleles. I think that immobile patients should be placed on um, not routine anticoagulation, but prophylactic anticoagulation. And this comes with um, its own complications. And again, this is something that I open up to the audience. Does heparin and Lovenox adversely affect bone? Heparin long-term has been used to, has been shown to decrease bone mineral density um, and low molecular weight heparin, Lovenox has also been associated with loss in bone mass. But the data in pregnancy, because it seems to be shorter term, has no, um, seems to have no effect on bone mineral density. I don't think there's a lot of literature. I don't think it's been well studied and it's not been studied in patients who start with low bone mass. Breastfeeding is good. The benefits have been clearly established. Um, but unlike pregnancy in the first and second trimester, most of the calcium obtained from breast milk is mobilized from bone. Um, and there's been estimates of, of, of decreased bone mineral approaching almost 5% in the first five months in women who breastfeed, though most women seem to re, um, recover. As I said in the past, high parity um, has not been associated with osteoporosis. Fractures, at least for sure in OI, are increased in the postpartum um, period. And for patients who have severe shortening um, of their upper segment of their arm or rhizomelia, mesomelia or short trunk actually may find breastfeeding to be very difficult and complicated. And so one of the things that is really important to me is that while we encourage our patients to breastfeed, not to make them feel guilty if they're unable to breastfeed. So how do you counsel a patient with severe progressive deforming skeletal disorder with regarding pregnancy outcome? I think it's hardly based on cardiopulmonary status. And you know, how do you manage them? Well, you know, obviously, what's the maternal diagnosis? What's the mode of inheritance? 
Um, are they going to pass this on to their child or not? Do they care? Um, we know this concept of non-assortative mating in the short stature um, community, which means that little people may mate with other little people and that can create um, disorders that we don't understand well. So we need to know what the diagnosis of a partner is if the partner is affected. Obviously, knowing what the mutational status and now that we know most of these genes, it's really important. What is a couple's feeling regarding prenatal diagnosis and termination of pregnancy? And the, the, the older I get, and I'm getting old, is I cannot even tell you. I, I've met couples who don't want to have disorders that they have, couples who don't care, couples who don't care if it's lethal. And I think you just have to sort of understand what every single person wants and what their needs are. Um, should a very short stature individual take the risk of a pregnancy if the fetus is predicted to be lethal? So I'm bringing this up as a concept. Um, uh, you know, a woman has achondroplasia, her mate has achondroplasia, they have a 25% chance of having a child with a, a double dominant or um, two alleles that are mutated. The likelihood of that child surviving long-term is not high. And what level of risk should they take? And I think as, as advocates, we just have to listen to what the patient wants and who is going to care for the patient. So for those of us who've been going to Little People of America, um, we have seen all sorts of um, non-assortive matings um, between some of these disorders. Um, and I think that the outcomes have been variable. Some of these disorders um, are associated with lethality. Many are not, but some of them are se severe. Um, Pre-implantation diagnosis um, via testing embryos is, is a way to avoid um, interruptions of pregnancies. I think it can be very effective for the right couple, but again, it's what the couple would prefer. I will tell you personally, um, chorionic villi sam villa sampling has been done in short stature women, but if there is a lordosis, the retroflexion of the uterus, uterus can make it a very challenging um, procedure. And as a result, many of these patients need to have amniocentesis, um, which again, makes the diagnosis at a later date. Um, this is something I did with my colleague, Ju Julie Hoover Fung, who looked at obstetrical um, anesthesia issues in women with dwarfism. And um, I think what we found was that most women with short statures tolerate pregnancy quite well. Um, this was done primarily with mostly patients with achondroplasia. Um, the major concerns were access to care, preterm labor, shortness of breath, back pain, motor delivery, and anesthesia. Um, in the study, again, um, that we did, that really Julie led, um, most of the patients, again, lots of patients with achondroplasia, um, did not deliver preterm statistically. Um, most of these patients started decreasing their physical activity around 24 to 28 weeks. It was just hard to get around. Most delivered close to term. The vast majority delivered by cesarean section. Um, and there was a difference in terms of whether you had a long trunk or a short trunk. So again, thinking of disorders in sort of how um, they physically look and again, their cardiopulmonary status matters. Um, management of anesthesia, which is really important, is really, is it gonna be regional versus general anesthesia? And for disorders with spinal stenosis or spinal abnormalities, a pre-MRI um, of the spinal region will make most anesthesiologists very happy. This rarely happens. But again, if there's a disorder that is at risk for cervical retrieval abnormalities or a dantoid hypoplasia, um, general anesthesia with intubation should be done with care. And all patients, even I think patients with mild OI, should have a pre-delivery anesthesia consult with um, the anesthesia team. There are special considerations for specific disorders, and I'm just going to leave this. You have the slides.
Um, but I would like to underscore the importance of, of hemorrhage, um, fractures, and use of medications and osteogenesis imperfecta. Um, bisphosphonates, it does cross the placenta. Um, and animal studies have shown that, they, um, that there was significant maternal and fetal toxicity. However, I actually went through the literature um, and there are more than 100 articles on bisphosphonates in pregnancy um, with some data. And clearly I would say that bisphosphonates used prior to pregnancy or um, even in the first trimester are not really associated with an adverse outcome. Um, and I think what is interesting that there are some isolated case reports of women either who had um, malignant hypercalcemia or were inadvertently treated for osteoporosis with bisphosphonates who ended up pregnant um, where, again, very isolated reports, but there was no evidence of physical or biochemical abnormalities um, in the fetus. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention. I want to thank the OIF, which I love, and to my colleagues. Um, and um, this is open to questions and discussion. Great, thank you. So I am going to